so has everybody done modeling in R before? Like, have we all done like a basic linear regression in R? I just, I'm just wondering, okay, everyone's nodding. Okay. So I think the point of this chapter is to kind of, um, basically, if you have no idea how to model, this is very much a thing for the beginner. If you have no idea what modeling is, you've never done a linear regression, you've never done like anything, this is what this chapter is. So I'm gonna go through it kind of fast-ish and I'm gonna slow down on a couple of things that I learned that I thought were kind of interesting that I'd never realized you could do with base R and I don't know, maybe, so stop me if I'm going too fast is where I'm going with this whole spiel. Okay, so as I said before, the first kind of point of this chapter is to get us used to this idea of how you do normal modeling in R language before we get to the tidy part. So throughout the chapter, or throughout this kind of notes, we're working with this trees data set, which is a pretty small data set. Um, it's basically just if you've got a tree and you have a measurement for its girth, which is you know how round it is and how tall it is, um, can you use those to predict volume? So of course we kind of have an intuitive answer that yes, you should be able to use those to predict volume. Um, there is of course an exact formula that you can use that will predict girth from the height and volume of a tree. Um, and so, you know, this is what I do. I assume this is what a lot of people do. First thing you do is you correlate things. So you can correlate all of the things with this core correlate here, which will correlate, basically spit out a tibble of all your numeric variables correlated with one another. So unsurprisingly, volume is um, well correlated with girth. Um, it's not as correlated with height. Oops, sorry. Um, and of course you can make a little plot like this using ggplot, right? And you can see that girth and height are related, which kind of makes sense intuitively if you think the older tree is, the taller it gets and the wider it gets. And there's this nice little pretty correlation. And here you can see that these larger trees over here are both taller and wider. So getting into how to fiddle, fit a model with base R. So with base R, the workhorse of almost every single thing you do is this LM function, or it's LM or GLM is the other one that you'll use. Um, and it basically can do everything for you. It does your linear regressions, it does your correlations if you wanna do it that way. Um, LM is, is your man. So the basic kind of way to do it is you use a syntax like this where you call LM. The first thing you call is the one you're trying to predict. In our case, we're interested in getting volume from everything else in a data set. And you do that using this formula context, which is the tilde or the, the wiggle, which is what I call it in my head. Um, this dot means every other thing in your data set besides the one that you're trying to predict. And you can explicitly call data equals trees here. So this is how you do a linear regression in R. Yay! <laughs> everything. Um, of course, when you call it, so this will immediately spit back its coefficients. Um, everyone knows how to do this without the, the formula syntax. So if you didn't want to do this wiggle dot, you can explicitly call which variables you're interested in. So let's say you had a bunch of other variables in here. Like let's say you had a big old data table that had 50 variables and you're really only interested in three of them. You can explicitly call them using this um, plus. So in this one, it's not as interesting because there's only three columns. Um, but if you had something like a data table with like your data frame with like 50 columns, you would use plus for each of the variables you wanted a main effect on. So simple, easy. I'm sure we've all done it. Um, if you want to pipe, you should wrap things in the formula call. The reason for that is because when you're using pipes um, with tidyverse and in, in Mergator, um, the dot is typically used as this left-hand side notation. So I, I did try this without the formula, it works fine, but I think it's one of those things that it can be a risky decision to not, so if you do this exact same thing without um, calling formula like this, it will still work. You can still see our studio, right? Hopefully, everyone's looking at this. Okay. So this will put out the exact same thing um, in this case. But I can very much imagine a scenario in which it wouldn't. So I think it's it's one of these things they're saying, if you're going to do this piping, it is safest to wrap it in a formula call so that you're explicit. Because otherwise, without this pipe, see if we have dots here, I can easily imagine either the linear model getting confused about what dot means what, 
or Margaret's are getting confused about what dot means to the dot. Is this the left-hand side or is this every other variable in my data frame? So if you're going to do it with Margaret's, uh, use formula. I got a question for the group in general about kind of using the the dot to mean every other variable. Do do y'all use that a lot? Because I find myself not doing it just because being explicit is often better. I I I agree with you. I typically don't for that exact same reason. I also have a tendency to have these really wide data frames that have tons of different variables and where I would never actually want to call a correlation. Or linear regression between all like my one predictor and my 40 things yeah i mean um for those of us in um if any of you are in the islr book clubs they talk about um best subset selection and how <laughs> you could have these really wide data frames and just the disadvantages of that so yeah Basically, what you were saying, you can't do all the variables, especially when you have a, not a very big N, is kind of the idea, so. I mean, you can, it'll just be nonsense. Well, yeah, <laughs> I guess there it would be a singular matrix. I, I, assume, I mean, I know there's, sometimes you, you, can, you can get something, but it doesn't work. That's when your P is greater than your N? Yeah. So you gotta pick some subset. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, when I have big data sets like ones Al talked about, they're often heavily autocorrelated to, you know, and mm -hmm. so like you're, you're sending a bunch of variables that are more or less the same. Kind of like this year with height and girth, right? There's, there's a pretty decent correlation between height and girth, which you can just visually see. And then it's up here, right? Girth mm -hmm. and height. Almost kind of silly to include. I mean, not totally, but it's almost not as informative to include them both. Right, okay. So the other thing we can also generate, which um, can oftentimes be the case is that the real thing you really wanted to model was an interaction term. So I think this is actually a good example for this, where the real thing that's predicting the volume of a tree is the interaction between height and um, height and girth, right? So it's not just, longness and wideness, it's that the two of them together are combining to um, actually really model things. So you can do it explicitly, um, say give me the interaction term and not just the main terms by saying multiply. So this will not multiply it, this will just say give me the interaction between these two. And this will give you both the main effects, so that's girth and height, um, and the interaction effect. Although when you build a model like this using an interaction effect, you should not interpret the main effects of girth and height. What you should really do is compare the model with the interaction effect to the one without it, if you wanna get, look at the main effects of the individual predictors. Um, as, um, as a I have a question. Um, actually, that's it, that is um, like, uh, it's, it's not a mult multiplication, but so, you see, it, it is in some senses. Yeah, I mean, it is in some sense. Yes. You don't have to think about the math of how it works behind the hood of a linear regression, but you're not, it's not like you're telling the, the model, um, give me the prediction of like a new column, which is the multiplication of with times growth. So it is a multiplication on the level of like, when you think about what the math does to get an interaction effect. Um, but it's not like yeah. a new problem or a new value. Uh -huh. This multiply. Um, if you want to do that, though, if you want to um, change a column within the LM, so you could actually, I think, do this explicitly here, like where you could say you could use this identity function. So you'd wrap i, i brackets, um, i parentheses around like girth times height, and then you would actually have the prediction of this, this multiplication. Um, but I personally would never ever do it like this. I would never change the column inside of the LM function. I would always make a new column first and then call LM personally. That's what I would do, um, but this is me. Uh, but you can, which I didn't know. I thought that was cool.
the other thing I thought was cool, sorry, I'm just kind of skipping a little bit through this, is that I did not know you could explicitly call for all of the interaction effects using this, um, what, are, what is that? Carrot. So let's say you had, yeah, okay. So this data set trees as it is only has three columns. So you can, you can just like explicitly call in the interaction effect like this. It's, it's pretty easy to do, right? It's kind of boring because there's only three columns. But let's say you had a column, like a data set that he had even more columns. So for example, if we add on like, I don't know, let's add an age to the trees. So they're, they're one, two or three years old and let's give them a species. So we could explicitly model all of the interaction effects for all of our different like columns that we have. So we could have girth times height, girth times tree age, girth times species, yada, 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 yada. That, that would be like a lot of typing plus you might forget a column name. That seems kind of like dangerous. So you will of course get the results blah, 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 like this. Um, the thing I guess to notice here is that LM will ex kind of implicitly under the hood turn a categorical into like a one-hot encoding. So you can see with species, which I put to be a categorical variable, it's just randomly, I think, A through A through D. Um, species A has been encoded as the baseline variable, so you don't see it here. Um, I think it's actually going to be the intercept for this. Uh, so species B, species C, species D, this is all, these numbers here for the main effect are relevant are relative to species A. So I guess the volume is what, for B you get negative 35 relative to A. It's kind of a funky um, fake example that I'm giving here, but that's kind of how you would interpret this. You can force uh, LM to not use an intercept. Um, there are times when you'd want to do that. Typically that's if you really wanted to get the explicit ones. Um, from my learning at, of undergrad, you should avoid doing it. Although I don't remember the caveat of why. I just remember somebody telling me, you really shouldn't do this. Like you can, but you shouldn't. I remember that too, but I also don't remember yeah, why. Yeah, same here. Everyone's like, don't, okay, <laughs> good. Is it related to bias? Uh, That's The sounds... other coefficients? That's but sounds... I have to look it up. I mean, I, I've gotten lazy after school where it's like, you don't memorize, you're like, I can just go Google. <laughs> I'll remember this fact for two minutes and then it will be gone. Um, okay, so the thing I thought was cool that I didn't know you could do is if you do it like this, so again, using the dot of everything else, and then this little like bracket here, that'll give you the two-way interaction between all of the other columns. So one example where I could imagine this being useful is actually in context of a pipe. So as Brandon, you were saying earlier, like I, I often don't use this dot notation, but I could see myself doing like a pipe where I'd go, you know, from big old data frame, select one, two, three, four, five, and then piping it in with formula and then using this column notation to get all of those interaction effects. Although like if you're using too many interaction effects, you're gonna like wipe out your, out anything meaningful um, out on the modeling stage. But I could imagine a scenario when I might do that. So I thought that was cool. I didn't know you could do that with LM. Um, so that's why I'm kind of pausing to talk about it as something interesting. Maybe other people didn't know as well. Um, right, it's easy to exclude a column. So just use a negative if you want to do that. Um, you can remove your intercept column um, explicitly by adding this plus zero. Um, yeah, you're basically forcing intercept to be zero. You might want to do it in cases where it wouldn't make sense for your predictive value to have something silly. But of course, typically what you would do with that instead is like, you know, I won't try to predict a negative value for a tree or I'll say really the values are only, my predictions are only as good for the ranges of girths and heights that you gave me. So if I'm trying to predict outside of that, maybe don't, but maybe with inside of it, it makes sense. Um, I think this is the same thing I said before. Um, yeah, under the hood, um, if you add a categorical variable, um, LM will turn it into a W variable. So here what they did is they added an ABCD group 
as I did previously. Ooh, it's done automatically. It's a cool phrase. Um, you can include polynomials. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is all good. Everyone's understanding these kind of three take home points of like, when you do a formula, you're the one doing the defining. It's being kind of defined by this wiggle notation. Um, there is basically some magic under the hood that will turn categorical variables into these dummy variables. And whether or not it's the predictor or the predictee is determined by which side of the tilde you put a column name. So that's, I think, the kind of basic take home points of how to do modeling in R on base R. Okay, so now into, I think, I don't know. I think interesting for me to remember um, is that basically you have diagnostic plots anytime you do an LM plot. And if you are a good sound analyst, you should always look at these plots to make sure that the assumptions you've made when you've done these models make sense. Um, because whenever you do any kind of model fitting, you're making a ton of assumptions about the distribution of your data. And that's even like how you get the idea that something is meaningful, right? You first had to make an assumption about the shape it's in. And then whether or not it fits that shape it's in will tell you whether or not your result is exciting. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind like, right, basic statistical testing p-values. I assumed it looked like this. Oh boy, it definitely didn't look like that. How terribly exciting. Um, so <laughs> the plots that I think are the most interesting are, so the normal QQ is basically telling you, does your data fit a normal distribution? Because LM under the hood assumes that your data has that beautiful little normal distribution. And what you wanna see is these dots kind of falling along these lines here. Uh, oh, the residuals are your errors. So you wanna check the residuals versus your fitted um, to see if your residuals have a non-linear shape. Um, so in this, I'll show you what it should look like. It's good. This is from the book. Okay. so. This one here, this is with the um, example of the, the grasshoppers and temperatures. So what they're trying to do is model the chirp rate by the temperature, which you can very clearly see is a linear relationship. Um, with our data that they've used here with the, the volume of the tree and the um, girth, that's not a linear relationship, actually. So it's it's, I think if you looked at the, this whole thing here, what is that? Non-linear, I guess, but my brain's too broke to figure out what you would call that. Not a straight line. So the residuals here are kind of flat-ish, which tells you that it is it is linear-ish, the relationship that you're trying to model. Um, and the other thing you want to check is that these differences in the theoretical quantiles versus the standard residuals, which is your amount of error, should be kind of lying along this diagonal. If they're not, it kind of suggests to you that the data you input was not really normally distributed. So this is an example of, yes, it looks like a good linear relationship, um, whereas in our tree example, this kind of shape like this suggests that our, our underlying um, data generating process is not really a linear relationship. So this is kind of what this shape means to us. Whereas something lying along like this, this suggests to us this is a normal, um, normal, normally distributed data. So these two plots, always good to make like as a sanity check for yourself. Also, if something doesn't seem to be working right and your model's real crap, it's good to check especially I think this one, because this, this is a really easy mistake to make, because obviously the first thing you assume is, well, the most logical thing is to start with a linear model because it makes the least assumptions about your data and then go onward from there. If this looks wonky like this, maybe start adding in some new like polynomials, a quintic, uh, quadratic as you will. Um, you can also use the GG Fortify package to do an auto plot of the LM object um, it's the same thing, it just looks prettier, and then you can use the ggplot syntax to tweak the data, tweak the plot you've got a little bit. So if you're trying to make it pretty, um, 
to present to someone, you have the GG Fortify and Autoplot functions that can do that for you. Okay, but of course, I mean, these are all really important things, you know, looking at this stuff, but like nobody really ever cares about the TQ plot or the residuals fitted, right? What they want to know is the coefficients, right? Like how many, how many points, how many dollars spent in my advertising budget increased my sales? You know, what is the exact relationship between the amount of me taking this drug and how much better I got? Like, you know, the coefficients, that's what we all want to see at the end of the day. So um, R is lazy and it doesn't actually calculate coefficients until you explicitly ask it to do that. So you can do it using the summary call to the fitted object, this LM object here. And this will output your residuals. And of course, the things you tend to care about are these things here. So you care about the stars boom, boom, boom. and you care about the estimate and your error for the most part. This is, this is what I, I look at. I, I look at stars, I look at the estimate, I look at the error. Um, and this kind of tells you in your, sorry about that, in your, oh, and the other thing, of course, you want to look at is your adjusted R squared. So that's going to tell you generally how well did your model do at actually explaining the amount of um, the, the data. And let's see if I can remember. I'm going to try to remember what the exact definition is. It's the amount of error that's explained. Anyone? <laughs> Am I close? It's something like this. It has to be amount of variation that is explained by the model. Yeah. So like how much movement around the mean um, is explained by the model of the Y variable. Yeah. Somebody jump in if I'm wrong. It's been a while since I've had any kind of metrics, to be honest. So. Sounds good. Uh, there is broom and tidy, which I, I hope everyone knows about broom and tidy. It's amazing. It's a lifesaver. If you aren't using Broom and Tidy, use Broom and Tidy for every time you do an LM. It's so much easier. I was like, it's those little things when you learn about it. It's like when you first learn about janitor clean names and you're like, whoa, <laughs> all this time that will be saved. Um, so yeah, Broom, Tidy. Um, you have these other helpful functions like Glance and Glimpse. Um, and then you can do lots of cool things um, once you get into like, map and per where you can like group things by their by their like you could group by species for example in this one you could do what's done here is basically they've made a list of so they did a bunch of fits so they did a regular fit an interpolated fit poly fit uh they excluded height they excluded the intercept uh they did they've done this glance here and then they select the id and r r squared and then they arranged it by descent and basically, this is comparing all of their models by the adjusted R squared, um, which is what this glance glimpse is giving you here, um, which is, that's cool. It's cool that you can do that. Per is fun. Um, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around it even today. I always have to Google it. I'm always going back to like this one um, blog post with, I think it was like world, world data. Like, I don't know if anybody's come across this blog post with per. <laughs> I read it every time I have to do this, um, but it's great. It's cool. You can do lots of fun stuff. Uh, oh yeah, this is this is their long thing of basically you take your trees, you can nest it, you can then map it using the LM formula. This dot x thing here is, I believe, from when you group it, you have something now called dot x. You can map the fit onto Broom's Tidy, and then map the fit back onto Glance. You can augment it, da 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 da, and you get this wonderfully fabulous, sorry about that, um, table of for each, oh gosh, for each group, you can get the intercept, um, the correlation between the girth and the height, a p-value, your standard error, all the exciting things. Um, and you can do the same thing, basically. Lots of cool things can be done with just LM. LM alone is the workhorse of a lot of R stats, and you can do it. And now that we have the per functions, we can like do all sorts of crazy cool modeling. So yay, woo, yay. <laughs> um, oh, 
So the other important thing to know with base R that is really helpful is using ANOVAs to compare two models. So this is, I think, like also one of those things you maybe learn in an intro to stats course is that you can use the ANOVA function to compare two models. Um, and the idea being is that you have a basic model and you have a more complicated model. So in this example, what they've done is they have model one, which is just girth and height as um, main effects by themselves. And they include an additional model which includes girth and the girth squared, as well as the girth, as well as the height. So the idea is if you give at the ANOVA function, which is a base R function, um, two different LM objects, what it will try to do is compare the difference in the residual errors and whether or not the difference in the residual error is explained is significant. So if model A has explains this much error, and model B explains this much error, are they significantly different from each other? The idea is that if you add a more complicated model to a more simple model, um, basically you can say, was it meaningful that we added this thing or not? Um, did it actually help us reduce our error? So in this example with the trees, it does um, seem to successfully reduce error. So this is, ooh, the pretty stars. Um, but basically this is just comparing the amount of leftover error. Um, and ANOVA is a regression. I, this is a great, this is, <laughs> this is a great comic. Um, everything's a regression. Um, yeah. Sorry, Anna. Sorry, Anna. What are the stars? What, what is the meaning of the stars? Oh, the stars are a significance code. So basically it's telling you whether or not, I believe the ANOVA when you do it this way is using, I think it's a chi-squared test to tell you whether or not the differences in the mean of the error are significant. I think it's what it does. So basically you have you have errors for all of your points um, with one model, and you have errors for all of your points with another model. And basically the idea is if the distribution of one is much lower than the other, you'll get a significant result on the ANOVA. So if this is all of my errors here for you know simple model, all of my errors from complicated model, if it's going this way and now they're all much lower errors, this suggests to me that it's better that I use the complicated model. Um, and that's what stars here are representing. So basically this tells us that the, I believe this is it, the residual uh, RSS, uh, this is significantly lower than this value is what this is trying to tell us here. And this is what these stars tell us. So if we put our regular fit and our poly fit in, I should turn that off for these things. Um, um, Basically, it's telling you that this model is significantly better than this model. Where where does the weight of the the bigger model, you, you know, like if you have more terms, where does mm -hmm. the weight of because there's there's a trade off right between you can have increased accuracy but you're overfitting. So I think I don't think you'll get that with ANOVA, but you can get that measure with um, the Aikiki constant here and the BIC constant, which we will definitely talk about at some point in this book for sure. I don't think it's in this chapter, but these are two measures that I know off the top of my head do take into account information criteria. That's what it stands for. Um, these, these two measures definitely take into account how much stuff you've popped into the model, right? Because, you know, there's that very ancient saying, you know, give me what three parameters. I can model an elephant, give me eight, and it can waggle its trunk. I don't know if anybody knows that, that, that I'll, I'll find the exact quote and there's a picture and somebody did the math thing, but yeah, you know, with enough parameters, you can perfectly, perfectly fit your any data. Um, but at a certain point, it's, you're not really adding a lot of information. Um, anyway, I don't think the ANOVAs internally do that, but I could be wrong. I don't think they do. Yeah, I think I think you're right. It's the AIC BIC. Um, I forget what they do, but yeah, I just remembered that, and I thought maybe it was part of this, but it's not. I I sped read this book like a like maybe when it first came out, and I remember these two things: the information criteria being talked about at some point in the later chapters. So I think we will talk about it at some point, um, but I don't think yet. Um, okay. This, I, I did not get what this was trying to tell us here, to be honest, um, unless you wanted to do some funky thing where if someone's trying to test your stats knowledge about 
to uniform distributions. What is the distribution of them? I guess it's a triangle. I, I don't know. Maybe I missed why we were seeing this other than like, you can generate a uniform distribution with run F. <laughs> you can empirically look at the distribution, like the probability density of two distributions. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I missed the point of this. Um, oh. <laughs> and then this, this is actually quite funny. So I did not know that there was, I think this is the last bit. There are probably lots of functions you don't even know that you needed. So for example, let's say you made a column called add, um, if you always call your data frames df, um, you did not probably know you were overwriting a density function, function which is in base R, which is a, <laughs> A stats um, is the density function for the F distribution, which is the, the null distribution that is used, I believe, for ANOVA. Um, so that's, I did not know that either. Um, I don't know if anybody knew that, have anybody's ever explicitly correct, tried to call, but as an FYI, you are doing that whenever you call a data frame DF. You're basically overwriting a stat, a base R function called DF. Which is and, and if you if you get it wrong, it's that object of type closure thing, isn't it? Is that what the error is? Well, oh no, this function. Is telling you it's like, oh, let's say I wrote a little function and then I messed up and I didn't write that this here should have been data. Um, it's going to give me this weird. It's going to give me this weird no applicable method for mutate applied to object of class function because df is actually already something in base r, which I didn't know either. Um, of course, this will never actually be a problem for you when you're calling an ANOVA because, because of the way func like packages works and namespaces work. So it will probably never be a problem for you unless you're explicitly calling the density function for the F distribution, which I, I highly doubt anybody of us, any of us is ever doing in our life. Um, okay, so then that kind of brings us to considering R already has so many different competing packages, um, not just base R, um, but there's also like the GLM packages, so GLM itself, there's parsnips, there was, there was, there was carrot, and then I think there was parsnip. So there's lots of like statistical modeling already in R. So what was the point of making this whole tidy package in the first place? And so the point is um, one, to be consistent. I, I think this is the most important part. So I'll start with it, even though they said it first, to be consistent because if you have ever tried to work with all of these different um, statistical modeling packages, like the big one I'm thinking of is GLMR, Glimmer, um, and then Carrot, these all kind of had different names for different things. So like if you had the, I think they say it here, why you might want to do this. Um, yeah, okay. So. You, you have all these different packages that do statistical modeling. This is actually from the book. And a lot of them you would use something like predict, but they might use a different um, object type. They might use a different like name for what they want to predict. They might use a different like, you know, you could have an, one, one that uses N for something, one that uses N trees, one that uses like response as its thing that you want to predict, one that uses posterior, one that uses probability. So this can be kind of tedious if you're trying to do a bunch of different modeling and trying to compare like the results of doing a GBM versus GBM versus an LDA. And you're trying to do it all comparing and maybe do, do it even in a pipeline or do an ensemble, so models on top of models. And if all these different packages all have different ways of calling things, it, it just becomes very tedious and difficult for you to do plug and play stuff. You need to rapidly switch from using one type of model to another type of model. Um, and so this is kind of basically, I think, for me, the most exciting part of tidy models in general is that they've basically taken all of the syntax from all of these really powerful R packages that exist to do stats, and they've built a way for you to plug and play each of these models in really fast, which I think is really cool. I think it's something that was missing in R for a while, for sure, because, you know, Python had has like the um, SkyKit learn, right, which is kind of everything has all the same syntax of like fit train, fit train, fit train. And I think tidy models is kind of giving us that now. So it's consistent, um, it's composable, which allows you to kind of break things down. So it breaks apart 
the way you um, tweak your data, from the way you fit your data, from the way you tune your data, um, which are all really interesting ideas. Um, it's inclusive. Oh, that's, that's cool. You can write your own um, error functions for it too. We'll, we'll get there what that means, but you can write your own error functions for tiny level stuff, which is cool. Um, it's human centered. Yeah, I mean, it's very explicit what you do whenever you need to do a like split train test. The words are split train test bootstrap. So this is kind of the like, why do it at all? Um, I, I'm, I'm happy with it so far. I think it's a very cool idea. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Anything else you guys wanted to touch on about, the, about this chapter? That's, that's kind of it for the notes for this one. It was super helpful to go through like what everything means. I, I remember like trying to figure that out on my own and it's like, ah, I totally forgot like, you know, what I knew a few years ago or what I didn't know a few years ago and just assumed and things like that. So thank you. Yeah. Woo. I'm excited for the next couple chapters. Actually, do modeling next chapter, guys. Yeah. A reaction there for. <laughs> the, the 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 fourth chapter is about MS housing data, so that would be quite straightforward. Then spending our data. Who is a uh, uh, who signed up for the other chapters? I think James was Laura, and then I signed up for spending our data. Laura for the MS data, and you are up to for spending our data, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So all good. I um. Uh, the the things that we this chapter add to add to me uh, are those uh, few things that I don't usually use, like the uh, variation in the formula inside the, the model, so like the identity function, so to the power of all, all to the power those things there. And uh, with tidy models, maybe it's slightly different because you you use uh, the receipt and the step functions for uh, for doing these things. So I guess the thing that's like nice about reminding yourself about how much you can actually do with LM is that sometimes when you're writing something in tidy model models, and I think they've They've even made a package for this, right? Like the uh, recipes or workflow, workflow, right? Like sometimes it's just, it's, it's a lot to type when you're doing tidy models. And sometimes it's just faster to just do LM, you know, select yeah. my, do a quick progression. Yeah, just yeah you're right. You're yeah. right. I, I don't know if you remember yesterday where we, when we were talking about the plots and the visualizations, it's, it's like making a plot with the plot function or using ggplot. So you, you have more uh, features, to, yeah. you can customize your uh, model. I think it's useful if you uh, need to assess parameters and you want to compare more than one model. Otherwise you can use base R, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But when, for example, uh, I've used pl the plot function and then ggplot, and now I don't want to use the plot function anymore. Because I feel that I have more the, the manner of, of making a visualization with ggplot. So I think it's the same with tidy models. So it might take a, a bit the, the, for the switch to, to get inside the day. But then the receipt, for example, package lets you use the receipt function with the step function. And that way you can do the. Um, like 
uh, adjust the, the data set doing the pre-processing part of your model in, inside the model, basically, inside a workflow. So then you can changing, adding, see how it works, leaving the receipt as it, as it is. So I think it's nice. What else? I don't know. Uh, we nearly done. Uh, my my question would have. Uh, so my my concern is about the sharing within models, different models, because you can use LM for example, and that's a linear model. You know, then then you can use GLM, which is a general linear model, but then you have many others. So uh, that that was a. Um, a tip from uh, ISL um, our book. So the, the one we, we were just we've been talking about yesterday, no? the introduction to statistical uh, learning. Um, and, uh, you know, simple models are um, quite straightforward to explain to the others, but then they have like poor uh, result. Well, yeah. a bit more complicated ones, yeah. I recently had a project where we had, what was important was the interaction term and having to explain to people who did not understand what was going on, what the interaction term meant was like, a mm -hmm. real, it was a real pain in the head, <laughs> like. Uh -huh. Yeah, the interaction term, term uh, it can be quite uh, visually clear if you think about uh, a simple, a few simple terms. When you have the formula, which is y equals to, I don't know, beta zero, and then plus beta one, x one, beta two, x two. And then the two predictor, x one and x two, you might want to put them in interaction so and then you do actually a multiplication so because you have the the sum of the two and then the multiplication of the two plus the beta three so I mean, you are i work with clinicians so the moment you start that, talking about betas and multiplications their brains just go and they're not yeah. Anymore. Yeah, that's 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 because it lets you to uh, put them in interaction. No? You know, you know, you you give them a power within each other to to see how they impact on the outcome. Um, and you might um, you see you see that with the correlation. Sometimes you, you do the correlation and then you see the two, two predictors are correlated with the outcome. And then when you do the first model without interaction and you see that the result uh, changes, um, the result change if you, I don't know, uh, when you look at the result, you see that there is the, the result of a simple model without interaction release um, a, um, a sort of uh, uh, equivalence, no? And then you, you see, you think about that, that, that will be uh, influenced maybe from someone else, for something else, and if you don't have any other predictor, you, you think about an interaction within the two. So then you use the interaction terms and sometimes it's very useful. Sometimes you see that with the interaction terms, everything is more stable. And when you look at the result, you, you have a, a, a more uh, uh, like um, an explanation that of the phenomenon, which is uh, quite uh, more clear. So you, you can say that that thing effectively happened because the, the, the predictors are acting within together. I don't know. It's quite difficult without writing anything. And <laughs> but um, 
uh, what, what are you uh, thinking about the, the what, what when you decide to use the interaction term and when not is not when it's not useful for you i personally only use it if i have prior knowledge like if i have a like a biological i mean in my case biological reason that i would use an interaction term because i think i i mean you know, I generally am against more complicated models um, because of the elephant example, you know? So unless I have a good biological reason to add on an interaction term, <laughs> I would steer away from doing so. This is my personal vibe for it. Uh -huh. It's by depend by Dan, it, it, it depends by the, the, the phenomenon that you are analyzing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've had them pop up before too, and uh, uh, oftentimes we try to explain why that would be the case, and then if we can understand it, then we uh, we push forward and use it in the model. The other thing that I think it's you can also get um, as a let's see, let me try and share the correct screen this time. So the thing to be aware is even if you've got the other thing that can happen is if you've got okay. So, this is just quickly my really long old thing where I threw in every single interaction term. If you just throw in every single interaction term, you know, something we know off the top of our head is that the main effect of girth and height should be significant in predicting volume, right? But if you, in this model, polyfit long, which has every single interaction, those are no longer significant, right? Height and girth are no longer significantly related to, to, um, to volume of the tree. And that tends to be because basically you're adding in all this other gunk, which is pulling away the real effect. And that's another thing to like avoid throwing in unnecessary interaction terms, in my opinion, is you can mask your main effects by doing this. Um, so that's that's my other caveat for it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Cool. So. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for jumping in. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. All right. See you guys okay. Bye. See you next week. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.